Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to NCC. To all of our first-time guests, we give you a big hello and a warm welcome. Also, to those watching on live, on live stream. Today, we are going back to week 25. If you're following along in the journal, you can see that week 25, we skipped it, and we're actually in week 27. But today, we're going to learn what it means to report gospel success. It involves changing some things about your life. If you change the way you see things, the things that you see will change. You may be saying, well, I don't see God at work in my life, or I am concerned about all the trouble that's going on in the world, and you feel discouraged. Well, it's important that you open your heart up to God's Word today, because I believe that God's going to speak directly to us individually, and if you're thinking that this is for someone else, think again, this is really for you, all right? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your Word that's forever settled in heaven. I pray that we could open up our hearts and minds to the word and let the Holy Spirit work through us as we study your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Let everyone say amen. In Acts 14, there are some crazy things that happened. The apostle Paul was stoned and left for dead. And Paul and Barnabas returned to Antioch after a very adventurous and yet fruitful missionary journey, and they came back with a report, and verse 27 is the one verse we're going to look at today from Acts 14, because there's so much in this one verse. If you just read it, you'll skip through some things and miss some powerful truths, so check this out. Acts 14, 27, and when they, speaking of Paul and Barnabas, when they were come, they had arrived back in Antioch, it gathered the church together, look at this, they rehearsed all that God had done with them. See that? They rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto who? Unto the Gentiles. So Acts chapter 14 is so powerful that it not only highlights our need for perseverance in times of difficulty, but also teaches us a valuable lesson on focusing on the positives by celebrating God's faithfulness, seeing God in every situation. Notice again verse 27. They rehearsed all that God had done. So they were able to report good news, even though bad things had happened on this missionary journey. They were focused on the successes and not the failures. They were focused on the winning and not the losing. What kind of thinker are you? How do you think? How do you see? Are you a ABT or a a, a DBT? Are you a deficit-based thinker or are you an asset-based thinker? What is your outlook on life? It's a probing question because I guarantee you that a lot of us are not looking at life the right way. But imagine with me what could be possible, just go with me for a minute, what could be possible if you focused on God's strengths rather than on your weaknesses? What if you focused on what God can do rather than on what you can't do? Because when you take your thoughts off of all that's wrong and start thinking about what's right, you build enthusiasm, you build, you build energy. You inspire yourself, and you also inspire those around you to be more productive and go to the next level. But but see, if you're a deficit-based thinker, if you're a carnal thinker, you'll be so overwhelmed by the negatives of life, and you'll be focused on what limits you. I know that we're bombarded daily with news of conflict and division and despair, and, 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 you know, there are some people that I know, and you may know people like this, that it's their job to rain on your parade. Maybe that's you. Maybe you always want to rain on some. Maybe you're a nattering nabob of negativism. Maybe you're just a perpetual pessimist saying, well, that that can't be done. It's never been done that way before. Maybe you're just living by Murphy's Law. The chance of a piece of bread falling buttered side down is directly proportional to the cost of the carpet. That's your mindset. If anything can go wrong, it will go wrong at the worst possible moment. See, uh, uh, 
for a deficit-based thinker, or I should say a, a carnal mind, it, it's like if you have a carnal mind, it seems like that the darkness is winning right now, that there's a, there, that there's a lack and not a surplus. For the carnal mind, <clears throat> they look at the world and they think, well, there's a deficit, a downturn, a subtraction, a limitation, a lack of abundance, and there is if you're, if you're only going to look at what Satan is up to. See, the Word of God teaches us that we need to fix our eyes on the positives. We walk by faith and not by sight. We don't walk with our natural eyes. We look through spiritual eyes. We're, we're going to be able to report more on the victories of what God is doing rather than the terrible work that Satan is up to. We've been quoting Ephesians 3, chapter 3, verse 20, all year long, now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, and to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages. I mean, this is a companion scripture that we've been holding on to as we go verse by verse through the book of Acts. Paul and Barnabas were spiritually minded guys. They journeyed through cities uh, like Lystra and Iconium and Antioch. And, and they, even though they're facing all of this hardship and difficulty, they're preaching boldly. Challenges? Yes, but they still are seeing lives transformed by the gospel. They were assets to those around them. Because of their mindset, they were spiritually minded guys. In, in, instead of dwelling on their rejections and the, 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 that they experienced, they were focused on the lives that were being saved. They, they, these guys were not just world travelers. They were world changers. They were ambassadors, and they persisted and sharing the good news of Jesus, no matter what's come, what was coming their way. And so we too, I believe, are called to be ambassadors of Christ. We're called to be hope dealers, uh, spreading the good news message of God's love in a world that feels forsaken and lost. See, here's, here's our struggle. We as humans are hardwired to be carnally minded. It's our default mechanism. It's so easy Come on, it's so easy for us to think thoughts of despair in worst case scenarios. Our, our inclination is to be worldly in our thought process. It's deeply ingrained. We, we tend to be more tuned in to negative signals rather than positive ones. For example, in, in today's climate of uncertainty and what's going on and what's going to happen in, in uh, November and the sensationalized headlines... We're besieged daily with the negative reminders of life. And it's no surprise that skepticism is on the rise and that worry and that, that anxiety levels are escalating. And, and what happens are we, we, we become habitual in our deficit-based thinking. And it's, it's like a pattern of self-fulfilling prophecy for some people. And, and the result is that there's mental depletion, spiritual depletion, emotional depletion. It's, it's draining. It drains you of the hope and the joy that you should have if you're going to hope to make a, a positive impact on those around you. But, but I've got good news. Despite our sinful nature and despite our biological programming, carnal thinking does not have to rule our lives. I like what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. Look what he says here. He says, the, the, the imagery is provocative. He says, casting down imaginations casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Look what it says here. Bringing into captivity every thought, every thought to the obedience of Christ. Bringing into captivity. I know that when you thought, I'm going to follow Jesus, it just means you follow Jesus and go to church and check the box and sing songs and and read a little scripture and shake a few hands and you're good to go. No, it's submitting your thoughts. I do not have the luxury of just thinking any old wild kind of thought that I can. No, my thoughts need to be, sub if I'm following Jesus, my thoughts are, sub even my thoughts are submitted to Christ. I don't, I don't have permission to think the way some people think. Because I'm, I'm a child of God. I am, I, my life is surrendered to Christ. I love what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2.16, he says, for who has known the mind and the purposes of the Lord so as to instruct him, 
but we have the mind of Christ to be guided by his thoughts and his purposes. So how do you think? What are you thinking about? What is your outlook on life? Are your thoughts submitted to Jesus? Do you have a spiritual mind or do you have a carnal mind? The Bible says to be carnally minded or fleshly minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. We say, well, I don't want to be so heavenly minded that I won't be any earthly good. Trust me, that's not going to happen. If you have a heavenly mind, the Bible says set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. So, so turning to Jesus gives us a change of mind. It's repentance. We learned that earlier this year. It's metanoia. That's the Greek word for repent. Change of mind. Metanoia. And I believe that we have to have some changes in our life. They say, how many, how many church members does it take to change a light bulb? The answer is, who said anything about change? It's so hard for us to think we need change. We get stuck in a rut. Many of you are in a rut, and your patterns of thinking are just the same old, same old. God says, not anymore. Today, there needs to be a mental adjustment, turning to Christ, having the mind of Christ, letting him guide our thoughts. Because if you change the way you see things, the things you see will change. So what do we change? Well, change the way you see yourself, number one. Now, this is going to be difficult. But if you've turned your life over to Christ, this, you'll see this happen. You're going to start changing the way you see yourself. Do you see yourself, okay, check this out. Do you see yourself as a victim of life or a victor in life? It's just a mindset. Some people are victims of everything. You know, they're victims. When Paul and Barnabas returned to Antioch, they had the mind of Christ. They did not dwell on the challenges they faced. They didn't see themselves as victims, even though Paul had been stoned, and many Christians were being stoned as they traveled. Now, not that kind of stone. Now, she, she already think of the wrong kind of stone. They were hit with rocks. They were stoned. Paul was stoned and left for dead outside the city. You know, imagine, you know, some of us go on a missionary trip. There's some that are going to the Philippines. Imagine our team go to the Philippines and they get stoned and left for dead and they come back to Muskogee and they, they, they're not showing us their scars and bruises. We're asking, why are you guys so bruised up? Hey, let me tell you about what Jesus did in the Philippines. That's what Paul and Barnabas did. They didn't come back bringing bad news. They came back with good news. Look at it, Acts 14, 27. They rehearsed all that God had done with them. They were celebrating, look at this, they were celebrating God's faithfulness in them. They weren't victims. They were, they were tools used by God in a mighty way. They didn't focus on their flaws. They didn't focus on their mistakes. They pointed all attention to God. Paul and Barnabas knew who they were in Christ. And... No, I mean, I think too many people make the mistake of defining themselves by their hardships, by their sufferings. This is what we do. I mean, it's true that challenges come to us because that's life. I mean, everyone in this room, are, I mean, if we had you stand up and say all this wrong in your life, we'd, have a, we'd be here till 10 o'clock tonight. But these challenges do not define us. I mean, some people seem to claim their problems. You know people like this? Like, it's become their identity and they name it as their own. They say, my cancer, well, my can or my arthritis, or, or, or my diabetes. They say, I am a diabetic, or I am a cancer patient, or I am depressed. That's their identity. I am depressed. Well, hey, my name is Simeon. Hi, depressed. You know, see, see what I'm saying? It's like, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. The more you dwell on the negative and identifying by the, it's a victim mindset that we shouldn't have, it's detrimental. Your, your primary identity is found in Jesus. Jesus is your Lord. Jesus is your Savior. He is your healer. Not your ailments, not your, not your struggles. There were these two ladies in Odessa, Texas, and this pastor friend of mine, pastors there for quite a few years, and and he told me this himself. He said that there were these two ladies. They would hang out in the lobby of the church. And you've heard of Dumb and Dumber? Well, they were sick and sicker. 
because they would one up the other one. One, one Betty, my, my arthritis is kicking up, and the other one say, well, Sue, my brucitis has hit me hard. Well, Betty, you know, I've got carbuncles, and I've got, you know, whatever, you know, my gallbladder taken out. Well, you ain't heard nothing. Like, I was just diagnosed, and they just kept one-upping the other. My pastor friend told me this. He said one day in the lobby, they were getting mad. They were, one of them said, you'll never be as sick as me. It's like they were priding themselves. You know, some people use their, their ailment as a way to get attention, as a way to get people to p- pull up close, and that is not the child of God's life. Is God moving in your life or is Satan moving in your life? Defining yourself as a victim can overshadow the truth that, come on, you are a child of God. You're loved by God. Now, it's getting quiet in here because some of you are guilty of what I'm talking about. If you're not guilty, say amen. amen. All right. The Bible says that, that life and death are in the power of the tongue. So you can speak words of life. You can speak words of death. And you, if you're repeatedly affirming that you're a victim of life, it's, 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 it's going to it's going to affect you in, in such a detrimental way. The Bible talks about the power of affirming words, speaking words that, that bring glory to God rather than focusing on negative circumstances. The Bible says in Romans 12 too, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. The renewing of your mind. Are you, are, are you being renewed in the spirit of your mind? Because if you're, if you're allowing your mind to go down all these dark roads, that is not the mind of Christ. We're commanded by God. We're commanded to be renewed in the spirit of our minds. This is a change. There's a guy by the name of Yosef uh, Shina, and um, that's how his name is pronounced. You can Google him. He is a Polish painter. He was a leading designer and director of a theater, famous guy. But he survived Auschwitz and Buchenwald Nazi concentration camps, and He was confined to a standing cell that was four by four, four feet by four feet, and just enough for him to stand and two inches of breathing room. But it wasn't just him alone in the the four by four cell. Three other guys in there with him, shoulder to shoulder, back to back, just, and for days, for days, 10, 15, 20 days, given a little bit of food, standing in their own excrement, But see, Joseph didn't see himself as a claustrophobic prisoner. He saw himself as a painter because that's what he was. He was an artist. And and, and so he he was able to change the way he saw himself in this situation. I mean, suffering sleepless nights, standing in a cell, in a standing position, he used his, his imagination to advance his skill and to build what he said a portfolio of his paintings. He would stand motionless in the cold. And he would, he would, in his, he would let his imagination go. And he, he created what he called mind's eye paintings. It's a true story. And he would, he would visualize his palette. He would visualize his colors and, and the oils and the canvases. And every detail would, would unfolded like a movie. And he was able to create and even catalog some of the paintings. And he would put the wet paintings over here. And then the dry paintings would go over here. Well, all while he's in a cell. For days. Painting was his passion. And he never stopped pursuing this vision, even when he was confined in the cell and deprived of the most basic tools. And here's what he said. He said that he saw himself as a painter and not a prisoner. He was a prisoner. He was in that situation. But he said he was only able to survive. He he saved his sanity and his life because he had the ability to take his mind out of that terrible situation. This is how Paul and Barnabas lived. They were, they were able to survive and thrive and come back with a good report. Reminds me of what Paul said in Romans chapter 8 and verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall separate us from the love of Christ, which is in 
Christ Jesus our Lord. This is, this is the Apostle Paul and his mindset. So if you're seeing God at work in your life, you're, you're, you're changing the way you see yourself. You're not a sheep of the slaughter. I need to say that. You, you, you may feel defeated, but you're not defeated. You may feel depressed, but you're, you're, that's not your identity. You, you may feel discouraged, but that's not your identity. You, you're not a failure. You're, you're not a loser. Can I tell you that? You are not a loser. You, you are not a has-been. I don't care what Satan is telling you. you. You are not a quitter. There's someone in this room, you may be on the temptation of quitting. You are not a quitter. You are not, you're not going to quit on your marriage. You're not going to quit on your family. You're not going to quit. You are not a quitter. You're not going to quit on God. I feel a spirit of prophecy here today. God has brought me to the stage to tell somebody, you are not a victim. You are more than a conqueror through him that loved you. You are a conqueror in Christ Jesus. God is not done with you. It may feel like your days are over, but God is not done with you. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how insecure you might be feeling right now. Of all the terrible things you've done in life, today is the first day of the rest of your life. Let Jesus take control of your heart and your life and your mind. Let the weak say, I am strong. Come on, let the poor say, I am rich. Don't say, I can't. Say, I can. I love what Paul said in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. Whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. If it's not good, don't think on it. If it's not honest, true, don't even talk about it. If it's not a good report, have nothing to do with it. If it's not bringing virtue, if it's not praiseworthy, do not let it come out of your mouth. Stop it. That's not God's will for your life. I know this is convicting because some of us are sinning by how we're thinking and how we're talking and going to church and singing our little songs and feeling like we're Christian, good little boys and girls, and we're just letting vomit come out of our minds and thoughts. Come on, get our minds on Jesus. Paul, Paul is speaking this from a prison cell right before he dies, a Mamertine dungeon. He's ready to, he, he's at the end of his life and Paul is encouraging the church in Philippi. He continues in verse 12, Philippians 4, I know how, I know both how to be abased and how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Hopefully this kind of preaching puts you in a good mood because I really believe that it's changing. It's life changing. When you metanoia, when you turn to Christ, you give him your thoughts. He guides you. He leads you. You, you, you see yourself as a saved, called child of God that's been adopted, chosen, selected for a purpose. Because if you're changing the way you see things, the things you see are going to start changing. So we change the way we see ourselves, but here's the second one. Change the way you see others. How do you see people? You look at them, you look over them, you see through them. Are you seeing people like God sees them? It's so easy for us to be busy in life and not see people as God sees them. Paul reported on how God was saving the Gentiles of all people. He was a Jew. Jews are not excited about Gentiles getting saved. But look what Paul says. Here we see it again. Let's look at it. Acts 14, 27. And when they were come, they had to gather the church together. They rehearsed all that God had done with them. And how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. This is a change of mind. If God's changing your thoughts, you're going you're to start seeing people as God sees them, right? If the gospel has transformed you, you're going to love like God loves. You know, God's all about saving people. And so then your desire to see people get saved people of every race, every nation, every ethnicity. 
God's love for people will become your love for people. This is how this works. For so long, Paul and the Jewish leaders, and we've learned about this, we got into Acts 10 and 11, we see how the Jewish leaders were opposed to Gentiles getting in. They thought that the Jews were the only ones that could get saved, but now Paul is celebrating, like, look what God has done. He's opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. All these different nationalities are coming in, all these different cultures. See, only, only Jesus can change people's minds. There's no, no special teaching from, you know, critical race theory that's going to teach someone how to love someone that's different than them. Only Jesus can do this supernatural work because it changes the heart. It changes the whole persona. Only Jesus can get you to let down your guard. Only Jesus can get you to include other people that are outside your sphere. So this is true. True gospel success, I'll say this. True gospel success as it relates to the kingdom of God is diversity. Because you, you, when you think of heaven, you think of diversity. All tribes, all nations, all people groups. That's what the church should look like. It's so important for us to see this. And it was important for Paul and Barnabas to report what God was doing among the Gentiles. Psalm 105, I love this, verse 1. It says, give praise to the Lord. Proclaim his name, make known among the nations. Make known among the nations what he has done. You know, there's a modern miracle among us. It's happened in the last month or so. Um, I'll give you a backstory on that. Some of you will know some of the story. Some of you will know any of it, but I've got to, I've got to take you where we're going to go. So back in 2009, my wife met a young lady and several young ladies from the ISU campus and ISU women's tennis team started eating in our home. And one girl by the name of Maria from the Ivory Coast, um, 6,000 miles, came to Terre Haute, Indiana. That's where I was pastoring uh, for many years. And so her mother, Odette, was the interpreter for the president of the Ivory Coast. And so Odette also came to visit us in Terre Haute. And the actual picture of her there is the same picture on her Facebook account. And that's our dining room um, blinds right there. So she, she just called Sonia the other day, and they want to come visit Muskogee. And so we were, she was talking to, to Maria and Odette, and they were you know, celebrating what happened back in 2009. And this was just a few, few, few weeks ago. Well, let's flash forward. Also, a few weeks ago, there was a, a prophecy that I felt like God wanted me to bring from the Old Testament into our modern-day world and, and what God's doing in Muskogee and in our church, a multicultural call that God's called us to pursue. Isaiah 55, 5, I will summon nations, nations that you do not know uh, will come and you do not know them and because the Lord wants it. And, well, the very next week, a young lady by the name of Dominique Came to our church, and many of you know the story. She's been coming ever since. She came and was just checking it out. Her and her son, Liam, live in the apartments right behind the building here, and their window faces the church. They didn't even know it was a church. And so Odette was with Sonia and um, uh, Winona at a coffee shop a few weeks ago, and they were talking about this. And Odette was saying, now I know why. I didn't come over and check this out because timing is everything. Because it happened just the few days after that Sunday that we felt that really strong that God is summoning nations. I'm thinking, well, what kind of nations live in Muskogee, you know, other than Native Americans? And, and I, I had not met a lot of people from other countries. And so, man, I felt like we're stepping out on a limb here. So you know that part of the story. Well, the rest of the story is this. While Sonia and Winona were talking with Dominique, Sonia says, well, well, I have some friends that are from the Ivory Coast and a lady by the name of Odette. And I just, you know, it's a small world. I wonder, you know. And so Dominique said, well, let me text my mom and my uncle. Well, in just a little bit of time, she came back with the news. Hey, can you believe it? My uncle and my mom know Odette. Okay. What? What in the world? 
I mean, from Indiana to Muskogee, from the Ivory Coast to Terre Haute, from the Ivory Coast to Muskogee, and then Dominique walks in. So, oh, oh, that's a coincidence you're thinking right now. See, that's the devil putting that thought in your mind. It's not a coincidence. Come on, that's God. That's God. Why? Because God loves people. God loves us enough to know. He he loves us enough to get us to know that he is working in our midst. And we have to be looking for him. If you don't change the way you see God, you're not going to see God. Because some people are seeing God the wrong way. That's my third point. Change the way you see God. If you're thinking of God like the old Bette Midler song that God's watching us from a distance or that he's watching us from the Old Testament or that maybe he was an ax, but he's not like that today, that's a lie from Satan. God is the same God. He still loves us. He's still moving. He is doing supernatural things in our midst. And it could be that your version of God is this watered-down, weak Little bitty God that's like right here, or maybe not even existent. You're like a theoretical believer, but practical atheist. That's some of us. We come and sing these songs, but like, it's almost like it's, uh, I don't know that that's God. I don't know that God really, hmm. Isn't it interesting, Pastor Simeon? Interesting. It's not a coincidence, it's a God incidence. And, And with the mind of Christ, we don't just have good ideas, we have God ideas. And I believe that there is a work that's being done here in Muskogee, here at NCC. And God wants us to be in on it. He wants us to see him at work. It's just a matter of changing the way you see things. You guys remember the Old Testament story in 2 Kings 6? where The Arameans were coming against God's people and they, a mighty army surrounded them. And Elisha was there and his servant was there. And the servant got freaked out because this mighty Aramean army was ready to wipe out God's people. And the servant said to Elisha, what are we going to do? Look at, the, look at the, how mighty the army is. Look at the enemy coming in. And Elisha, he's just like, I can see him like, God, this guy, could you open his eyes? Let him see what's really there. The Lord opened his eyes and all of a sudden the servant looked around and a panoramic view of all these mighty angels. Chariots of fire, so mighty that it made the enemy's army look like nothing. And and just as God opened up the servant's eyes, he blinded the enemy. God blinded the enemy. So I'm praying that God would open up your eyes. And as he opens up your eyes and my eyes to see him at work and what You know, we're not just coming to brick and mortar. This is not just a a room that we're in. No, as we gather as the church, Hebrews chapter 12 says, you've come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, to an innumerable company of angels, to Jesus, the mediator of a better covenant, to the church of the assembly of the firstborn. This is what we've come to. This is what we've gathered. It's mighty. God is moving right now. He is here. If you really saw what God is doing, what angels are standing at his attention to be, di- to, to be dispatched to do what they're supposed to do in Muskogee. And God is waking up his church to see not just what the enemy's up to. And we've seen a lot in the last four years. We've seen the enemy doing a lot. But God's just opening up our eyes. We see the enemy, but on the other side of the enemy, we see a mighty God that's ready to work on behalf of his people in this dark and evil day. Come on, it's just, if you change the way you see things, the things you see are going to change. Now, I wish I could say it. I wish I could say it like, like God wants me to say it. I just, I feel it so deep in my heart. God loves you, and he, he doesn't want you to just sleepwalk your way through life. He doesn't just want you to just punch the clock and pay the bills and just meander through life in an aimless way. He has got you on divine assignment. He's got you. And, and, and you, when you start talking about what he's doing, it fires people up. Let's come on. Let's start talking about it. It's not a coincidence when God gives us little God wings.
there was a man, um, and I'll abbreviate this story. He was an architect. He was a, a builder of sorts. He remodeled homes, but his adult daughter, she was in her early 20s, worked alongside her dad, and she was good with uh, the computer and CAD drawings and architectural drawings, and so they would work together, father and daughter team. And they would send little notes back and forth, and even in business notes, they, they would, he would write his name and love you, and then put a little smiley face. And then she'd write back and emails, there'd always be a little smiley face, texting, a little smiley face. Well, she got sick and um, she passed away and it crushed him. It devastated him. And he, they, he was a Christian. He was saying, okay, God, what's going on? I don't see you anywhere. I don't feel you. And um, he was on the back porch one day and he had stopped his building process and, and all of his stuff. He was just trying to regather strength. And he looked up into the night sky and there were clouds had formed and but they had parted and revealed the moon and in the slow parting of the clouds it formed like a smiley face in the sky well it's coincidence right so but it kind of warmed his heart almost like okay and so it, it kind of made him feel a little better and but maybe just a coincidence and so a couple days later he decided to get back into the work, they were working on a, on a house that they had paused the work, and it was an old house built in the 30s. And he was, they had been removing wooden shingles from the side of the house. That put on back in the 1930s, old wooden shingles that had started rotting. And so they had been scraping them off, and he, so he was scraping them off, and they were piling up around the house and worked all day. And at the end of the day, he's scooping up these shingles and putting them in the dumpster and he's picking up a few of them, throwing them like a frisbee into the dumpster and he's just just trying to get through the day and he picked up a shingle and it flipped over and he looked on the back side of it and there was a smiley face. Someone back in the 30s building this house had put a smiley face and nobody's ever going to see it again. This day, this Christian man, grieving over the loss of his daughter, God kind of winks at him and says, I see you, buddy. You're going to be okay. See, that happens all the time. God is, he's, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. He's showing up. We just got to see him. And that's maybe my sign today is to maybe like, change the way you see God. Start looking for him. Maybe just start looking for him. You might be going through a time of sickness or, or, or family situation. Just look for him. Don't despair. Don't think worst case scenario. I'm, I'm preaching pretty hard right now. I'm, I'm, I'm coming at you because I believe God want, he wants to show you the reality of himself. He is real. He's a very present help. Wow. Won't you just lift your hands right now where you're seated? Just maybe in a posture of receiving. Father, in Jesus' name, we just sit here, we soak it in, what you're speaking to us, what you're saying to us through your word. Forgive us for Neg negligent, mindless kind of thinking, haphazard thinking, worldly thinking, carnal thinking. Give us spiritual minds. Give us minds that are tuned in to seeing through eyes of faith. We know, God, that without faith, it's impossible to please you. For when we come to you, we must believe that you exists and that you reward those who diligently seek you. We're diligently seeking you right now. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would accompany these words and let your word that's been spoken today penetrate every heart. Give us revelation of what you're up to. 
There's a mighty work that you're doing here in Muskogee, here at NCC. Use us. Help us to be like Paul and Barnabas. Help us to come back weekly with reports of gospel success, of what you're doing on our jobs, what you're doing in the community, what you're, what you're doing in the city and in our church. Why don't you stand with me right now? I want to ask you to do something. One, one other thing, and then we'll go. I want you to um, just lay hands on the shoulder of a loved one, a spouse, a son or daughter, a companion. Just lay your hand on them. And I'm going to pray again, but I want you to pray too with me. Let's pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, wake us up as a church. Use us in a mighty way. Every person in this room, God, you've got great things in store for them. Help the enemy not to be able to steal it. Lord, we rebuke Satan. We take authority over him in Jesus' name. We cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ. We bring into captivity every thought. I pray for my, my friends here today. We pray for one another. Help us to be like Paul and Barnabas. We've got our own missionary journeys to go on this week. Help us to have the Holy Go to see your work done. In Jesus' name, let the church say amen.